Let's prepare ourselves to come into God's presence. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you that we can come to you as we are, with all our joys and sorrows, our faults and failures, and you welcome us as your children. We pray that you will forgive us for the things we have said and done in the past week, which have hurt others or caused trouble and confusion. We thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning. We praise you for the way you have showed your love and power in the past week. We have seen you at work and we praise you. Open our eyes and our ears this morning to see more of your power. Help us to feed on your word and take it deep into our hearts. Bless those who feel sad or troubled today or those who feel you are far away. Will you come to us with your loving presence to restore us and lift us up? In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So I'm going to ask Rupert to come up. Would you like to be on this side? On oh. this side. I don't <laughs> Right. Um, many of you will remember that, uh, that Rupert's been here before. A few people nodding. Um, yes, good. <laughs> and unfortunately, we've been interrupted thoroughly, haven't we, by the pandemic. And life has be become rather chaotic <laughs> as a result. But it's great to have you, have you here again. Thank you. And uh, we're going to continue, uh, Rupert's going to continue with our new series. Last week, we had um, Jesus talking with Nicodemus. Sorry, Peter. Peter. <laughs> and today it's Jesus talking with Nicodemus. That's our topic for today. But before we do that, um, I would like to ask Rupert some very quick questions about himself. So Rupert, when you were younger, <coughs> you worked abroad for many years. Can you tell us which countries you lived in and briefly the work that you did in those places. Just a quick one. When you were younger, that's very apt on somebody who was 65 just oh, a few days oh, ago. Right. So when I was younger, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've worked uh, abroad in Pakistan. Uh, we were there for 10 years. We did agricultural development work up in the mountains of the north of the country. Um, in two different locations, one in an area called Baltistan and then in uh, another in an area called Kohistan. So uh, after 10 years in Pakistan, we then had nine years in Thailand. And um, for seven of those years, mm -hmm. I was the um, senior pastor of Chiang Mai Community Church, which is uh, a church that provides a spiritual home and fellowship for many missionaries who are working in the Southeast Asian region. So people working in <coughs> Myanmar and um, China and uh, Laos and other, mm. other countries, mm. as well as in Thailand. Mm. Yeah. Was there a third one, third country? Um, well, the third country has always been England. I started off with the, in the Birmingham City Mission. We were there for 11 years. Uh, so we did um, Birmingham, Pakistan, Thailand, right. and then back to right. England. Okay. Yeah. So now you're living near Newant. Yes. And very active in the church there, which is um, quite vibrant, isn't it? And it's going, going well. Um, and you're working with an agency in Bath called Echoes of Service. Well, it's now Echoes International. Echoes International, yeah. right. Uh, over th right. Since the last three years, okay. yes. Can you tell us a bit about that agent, C, and what your role is in that ministry? Um, I'm the missions director, so my role is um, involved in mobilizing people, um, 
sharing the opportunities there are um, for mission around the world. We have 186 mission partners in 30 different countries. Mm. Um, but we're promoting the needs of mission um, in our world today, especially in countries that are unreached, where mission work isn't happening. Um, and so um, we're also involved in establishing partnerships with other agencies mm -hmm. so that when we get people coming forward that we have done, um, to work in some very challenging contexts that we can do that in partnership with others. Right. And I gather there's a big celebration coming up, is there? Well, this is our 150th year, and um, I've been responsible for preparing for this year. Um, and one of the things we've done is to develop an exhibition, an interactive exhibition, um, describing the 150 years. We've also um, developed... Uh, a book which is here and uh, that's entitled Footsteps Worth Following and it's uh, 150 <laughs> photographs with 150 stories describing 150 years of right. mission. Mm. So um, that's available. We've done something for young people as well. Um, we wanted to interest uh, people in mission from a young age. So we developed something called Mission Expedition. These are mission stories, each of which then link with uh, a worksheet here. And uh, I'm particularly, well, one reason I'm pleased with this is my daughter-in-law, Christina, designed it and oh, did all the design right. work for that. And I think Lovely. she's done a fantastic job. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> there you are. Mm. Yes. Yeah, mm. no, that's right. Yeah, so in um, three weeks' time, uh, we're the first church at Glebe Chapel in Newent to host the exhibition. So we'll have the exhibition, we'll be showing the film, then we will have a program. There's a program on Friday evening, then Saturday afternoon. Um, and then it, the weekend finishes with our Sunday service. And these events are called Footsteps Worth Following. And uh, what's happening at Glebe Chapel, the details are on here. Mm -hmm. And you'd be very welcome to mm -hmm. come along if anyone Thank would you. like. And these resources will be available oh, there great. at that event. Thank you very much. Interestingly, Jonathan's, Jonathan has family relatives who have worked with e Echoes in the past and still, at the moment, they are still, yeah. So we, we feel quite comfortable with that sort of uh, Good. agency. Great. Yes. Thank you, Rupert. We're going to sing again. Would you like to take Thank your you. seat? And um, we're going to sing two worship songs. Jesus shall take the highest honour and be still for the presence of the Lord. And we'll sing them right th just straight through without a break. So do stand and sing. Let every tongue confess Jesus. 
is Christ, God's only Son. Sovereign Lord, we give you glory now.
Alleluia. Let us pray. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Be still, for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. We come into your presence, Lord, and ask you to help us. Help us in every part of our lives, even when we do not understand. Be with us with your spirit. Guide and lead us with your hand. Shine your light for us to follow. The words of the last hymn reassure us that you are here with us always and that you can hear our prayers. We pray for all who work for peace, unity and healing throughout the world. We pray for world leaders and heads of government that they will seek an end to war and violence. We pray especially at this time for the situation in Ukraine and on its borders. We pray that a diplomatic solution can be reached in this conflict. We pray for the poor of the world and for all those who suffer from hunger and fear, both abroad and here in Matson. We pray for the international agencies who are working to bring sustainable projects 
to provide clean water and food to starving communities. We pray for the work of food banks and for food drops that are so necessary locally to us. We pray for those who are homeless, for the work of Gloucester City Mission and the City Council to help those who need care. We pray for those who suffer from depression, anxiety and other mental health issues. We pray for their families and service providers and for greater understanding of these illnesses. Loving God, we pray for our natural world. We know we need to take care of it, making better use of scarce resources and pres preserving biodiversity. Please guide those in authority to make decisions which will not damage our planet further. We pray for those whose lives have been impacted by storms this week. Storm Anna that hit southern African countries, causing devastation in Madagascar, Mozambique and Malawi. Storm Malik that caused damage and power losses in Scotland, Northern England and Denmark. Snowstorms pummeling the US east coast, causing road closures and power losses. Lord, we pray for an in easing of the COVID pandemic, a light at the end of the long dark tunnel. We pray that the vaccines will be urgently shared with poorer countries and remote areas where they have not yet reached. We give thanks for the NH NHS staff and volunteers here in the UK who have given their time to facilitate the rollout of the COVID vaccines. We pray for the work and service of the NHS, care homes and day centres. We pray for the charity organisations and shops who raise money to help. Lord, we pray for all who are finding their lives painful, lonely or uncertain especially those who are ill or vulnerable. Please help them to sense your love and comfort in times of need and bless their families and carers. We lift to you those in our fellowship who are frail and ill, those who are receiving treatment and those who are in hospital. Please lay your healing hands upon them. Lord, we pray for ourselves as we go from this church today to start the week ahead. We ask that in all we do, we may walk more closely with you, safe in the knowledge that you are by our side and that your fatherly love knows no bounds. Lord, let your will be done in all things. Your will, will is for good alone and we trust that you will set everything right. Please help us and bless us through your word, through everything we are allowed to hear from you. Father, please accept our prayers. Amen. Jim? Jim's going to bring our reading. The reading this morning is taken from John chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. A well-known reading that I think we'll all understand. There was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. One night <clears throat> he went to Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent by God. No one could perform the miracles you were doing unless God were with him. Jesus answered, I am telling you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can a grown man be born again? Nicodemus asked. 
He certainly cannot enter his mother's womb and be, be born a second time. I'm telling you, replied Jesus, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. A person is born physically of human parents, but is born spiritually of the spirit. Do not be surprised because I tell you that you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes you to hear the music, the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it's going. It's like that with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? asked Nicodemus. Jesus answered, You are a great teacher in Israel, and you don't know this? I am telling you the truth. We speak of what we know and report of what we have seen. Yet none of you is willing to accept our message. You do not believe me when I tell you about the things of this world. How will you ever believe me then? when I tell you about the things of heaven. And no one has ever gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For God, so, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be his Saviour. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe in have already been judged, because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true comes to the light in order that the light may show what they did was in, in obedience of God. Amen. Thank you, Jim. <coughs> Before, before Rupert comes to speak, um, we'll have one more song, and this is called Oceans, you all know it. And R Rupert suggested this song because of the idea, the theme of somebody setting out, going into something new, something like that. So we'll stand and sing this one song, and then we'll ask Rupert to come up. Oceans.
It's good to be here this morning and to have the second in your new series of uh, Conversations with Jesus. I've called this one Seeking the Light, Nicodemus, this conversation with Jesus. I remember when we worked in Pakistan, uh, having some significant conversations, sometimes in the evenings when it was dark, um, when people came and knocked at my door, we had this man called Suleiman who used to come and knock at the door and he very surreptitiously carried a flute with him because playing musical instruments had been banned in our area. And so he would come and sit cross-legged in our betek, our guest room, and uh, play his instrument, um, which was quite fun. But I remember another conversation with the brother of, or, or the brother of the person who used to work with us, the son of the landlord. And we were sitting in the courtyard under the night sky, surrounded by mountains. Our village home was at the juncture of two rivers, uh, a mountain river coming down and a big river coming this way. So if you've ever lived near to a motorway and there's that constant sound, it, it was like that. We lived with the constant river sound. And I remember that conversation. I remember explaining to him, he. Muslim people find it very hard to understand, don't really believe that Jesus died on the cross. And so explaining why Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross. Asked him questions like, do you believe God is just? Yes, I believe God is just. Well, do you believe God is merciful? Oh yes, I believe God is merciful. Tell me. How can God be just and merciful at the same time? And then told a story that further illustrated that the justice and the mercy of God met at the cross. Nicodemus comes to Jesus as at night and is portrayed as someone who is seeking illumination. He's seeking the light. He wants to learn from Jesus. And that's affirmed by the commentary that follows the recorded exchange. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and won't come to the light because their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So Nicodemus coming at night from the darkness to Jesus, who um, we know as the light of of the world. He said, I am the light of the world. And he said, I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. So Nicodemus comes from the darkness seeking the light. He may have been seeking the light, but in this recorded conversation, he doesn't see the light. Jesus first says to him, no one can live under the kingship of God unless he is born from above. And he doesn't get it. His thinking is flat, it's horizontal, it's earthly. He's puzzled and comes up with this absurd thought of an old man going back into his mother's womb. Jesus goes on to develop his thought to live under the kingship of God is a work of the Spirit of God. Nicodemus, in his thinking and living, needs a breakthrough from above. 
Maybe what Jesus said reminded Nicodemus of these prophecies in um, Ezekiel. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Those verses are saying that only by the power of the Spirit of God and being transformed by him can we live lives that honor and please him. In the next chapter of Ezekiel, chapter 37, it's this vision of the valley of dry bones and Ezekiel is called to prophesy over the bones and as he does so they come together and are remade with bodies. But these bodies don't live until they're breathed on. Just as in the creation story in Genesis. It says, the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. In John chapter 1, John briefly refers to Jesus' baptism in which we see the symbolism of cleansing water and the work of the Spirit. The other Gospels relate that the heaven was torn open and the Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove and a voice came from heaven, you are my Son, whom I love with you. I am well pleased. And John's gospel is written that we might believe and have life in his name. And through believing, we would receive the right to become children of God, children who are born of God. Nicodemus needs the spirit to break through his flat way of thinking. He needs a whole new dimension to come on him from above. And for that, he needs to embrace the mystery of the moving of God's Holy Spirit. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Have you ever been on a hilltop where it's been blowing so hard that you've been able to lean into the wind and the wind has held you up? Yes, <laughs> I remember doing that on a cliff and, and looking down to the, I think it was seals and things, I think it was Pembrokeshire, and the wind was just so strong that you could put your hands up and lean right into it. And the mystery of the wind, where does it come from, where's it going, the strength of the wind, the power, is the illustration that Jesus uses here. So here's a first question which we're not going to answer now, we're just going to lodge, register, remember that it's there. Do we embrace the mysterious moving of the Spirit of God or do we resist it? I think to Nicodemus we might ask more particularly, is your understanding and thinking about God all so worked out, all so neat and tidy, that you've effectively put God in a box so he's got no room to move? Because he was a thinker about God. <laughs> but he needed to have God come into his life from above and to be radically changed. I'm going to move on to the second part with the second question. Focusing on verses 13 and 14, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, 
so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. This is a a snake on a pole that was carved by a Pakistani craftsman who I met at a craft festival and I got his name card and when I went and visited his workshop, I saw it in the corner of the workshop and I said, oh, is that for sale? And he said, yes, and I bought it. And it's just very applicable for the scripture today, isn't it? But there's a very relevant story that goes with this. Janet and I studied agricultural zoology at Leeds University. That's the pests of crops and the parasites of animals. And one day, Prof Lee was giving a lecture, and he was telling us about nematodes, these tiny worms that infect human beings. In fact, they live in people's blood vessels. And they break out in, in a, a sort of a lesion on the skin that is very itchy and very hot. And so the natural response is for people to go to a pool and to bathe it. But that's how the disease carries on, because that becomes a source of infection, because that's got the worms and the eggs in it. There's only one way that you can get rid of this infection. And that is you take a small stick and you attach the end of the worm onto it. I hope we're not all too squeamish and you can handle this. And you have to very slowly turn that stick in order to get the worm out without breaking it. Yes, exactly. Yes. Now, the interesting thing is, there's only one place on the planet where this is a problem, where this infection exists. And it is the place where Moses led the people of Israel through the desert. And when Moses lifted up the pole, he was lifting up the way that people could be free from that infection. And so when it says all who look to to the bronze snake on the pole would live, they actually not only had to look, but they had to act. They had to do something. Here was the secret, if you like. Here was the clue. Here was the solution. And they needed to respond and to do something about it, which has a very good application to Jesus um, when he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Sometimes, I think, we can emphasize the need to believe, the need to make a decision to follow Jesus, and what is neglected, it seems, is the outworking of that belief. It's not only the decision that matters, we need to follow on. And that's actually, if you think about it, what that illustration with the pole on the stick um, signifies. And certainly when we look in other places in the New Testament, for example, James chapter 2, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? And also... Jesus' teaching about Judgment Day in Matthew 25. Back to the conversation that is the focus of this morning's message. We've only got three exchanges in this conversation recorded. So here's my question. What are the characteristics of this conversation. 
What are the characteristics of these exchanges? How would you describe the nature of Jesus' words to Nicodemus? I'll remind you. His first exchange, the first thing Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How would you describe that in a conversation? Another thing he said, he only said three things. The second was very similar to that. And the third one was, you are Israel's teacher and you don't understand these things? What, what kind of a remark is that? Any comments? Uh, well, yes. Straight. <laughs> Straight to the point. That's quite a challenge, isn't it? How often do you have conversations where you think to yourself, well, I need to have a conversation about this, but it takes you about an hour to get there? <laughs> Didn't take Jesus, did it? In this instance, of course, you'll find that all the conversations have a different character. But what are the characteristics of this conversation? One of them that Jesus is challenging. He's provoking. He gets straight to the point. Maybe sometimes we need to a bit more. And when we think about that, going back to question one, do we embrace the mysterious moving of the Spirit of God, or do we resist it? Jesus had been saying to Nicodemus, you need to be changed, and that change can only come from above. And Nicodemus was thinking in a very flat, earthly way, wasn't he? And Jesus was saying, no, that needs to be changed. How much? <laughs> Radically changed, didn't it? And, and it's only the Spirit of God can do that. And he's saying that God's Spirit moves mysteriously. If we live with the thought that God's Spirit moves mysteriously and we want God to move, how does that affect how we live? Changed completely. Changed completely. Absolutely. And, and we can expect God to change us completely and know that he can. A new beginning. It is. A new beginning. Yes. Some thoughts to take away with us. It's good to have some specific questions um, and give you some things specifically to think about. Just a, a postscript, really. Nicodemus appears two more times in John's Gospel. In chapter 7, verse 50, there's a meeting of Jewish leaders when Nicodemus speaks up in defense of Jesus. And then in chapter 19, he's going with Joseph of Arimathea to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus in order to give him a decent burial. What would it have taken to go to Pilate asking for the body of Jesus after he'd been crucified? What would that have taken? Courage. Courage. Had, had Nicodemus been changed? Yes. 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 Had the Spirit of God mysteriously worked on someone who could only think in one kind of way so that he thought in a completely radically different way? Yes. Yeah? And that was the challenge that... Jesus had brought to him 
And we can see by the end of the gospel that change had taken place. May that encourage us and, and help us. And maybe we can look for change in our own lives and trust God in a change in others' lives because of the power of God's transforming spirit who moves mysteriously in ways that we can never um, control or tie down. Well, I hope you'll take some of those questioning thoughts and take them away with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Rupert. It's given us a lot to think about. We're going to have our final hymn now, and then possibly some notices. Bob, where's Bob? Yeah. So we'll sing our hymn, Lord for the Years, and then we'll have some notices, and then we'll have a prayer at the end, and then you can go for tea and coffee. Right, Lord for the Years. Please be seated. Uh, thank you, Rupert. Um, just to say there's tea and coffee afterwards, which you probably guessed, and I would invite you to sit at a table and actually pick up on some of those points, those questions, and just discuss them with the people on your table. But if there's anybody here who has been challenged on a personal level that, you know, to, to renew their faith or to take a step of faith for the first time, then do come and speak to somebody. We've been challenged this morning about a new life, about um, new beginnings. So do come and speak to Rupert or to speak to one of the, the leaders and um, share that with them, and we can pray for you. Um, two other notices of some minor importance compared with that. Um, as a, as a, but are, they are important in, in their own right. It's a church meeting on Saturday, um, 
in the hall, 10.30. Do come, do, do come and make your thoughts known. Everything from services in the future, services in the past and so on. And also where, where we go as a church, which leads us on to a reminder that we have this day of discovery on the 19th of March at 11.30. That's just a, a notice for another month month and a half, but um, don't put that in your diary, please. We can just sort of investigate our, have a look at our future and under God's spirit. I mentioned that. Um, next week, um, we've got a, Margaret's talking about the Samaritan woman. Margaret's back from a holiday on Tuesday. Um, and it's the topics, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. But after, the, after coffee at 12 o'clock, we're going to have a, a short time of uh, prayer for BMS, the Baptist Missionary Society, and, and it'll just be a, an opportunity. It's, the, it's their sort of day of prayer nationally, so we're going to do it at 12 o'clock. So if you want to have a coffee, come back in. It'll be about half an hour. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Right, let's, let's close with a prayer. And now, may the God of peace equip us with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen.